This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 9 Twala the King It will not be necessary for me to detail at length the incidents of our journey to Loo. It took two full days traveling along Solomon's Great Road, which pursued its even course right into the heart of Kukuana land. Suffice it to say that as we went, the country seemed to grow richer and richer, and the corrals, with their wide surrounding belts of cultivation, more and more numerous. They were all built upon the same principles as the first camp which we had reached, and were guarded by ample garrisons of troops. Indeed, in Kukuana land, as among the Germans, the Zulus, and the Maasai, every able-bodied man is a soldier, so that the whole force of the nation is available for its wars, offensive or defensive. As we traveled, we were overtaken by thousands of warriors hurrying up to Lu to be present at the great annual review and festival, and more splendid troops I never saw. At sunset, on the second day, we stopped to rest a while upon the summit of some heights over which the road ran, and there on a beautiful and fertile plain before us lay Lu itself. For a native town, it is an enormous place, quite five miles round, I should say, with outlying corrals projecting from it that serve on grand occasions as cantonments for the regiments, and a curious horseshoe-shaped hill, with which we were destined to become better acquainted, about two miles to the north. It is beautifully situated, and through the center of the corral, dividing it into two portions, runs a river, which appeared to be bridged in several places, the same indeed that we had seen from the slopes of Sheba's breasts. Sixty or seventy miles away, three great snow-capped mountains placed at the points of a triangle, started out of the level plain. The conformation of these mountains is unlike that of Sheba's breasts, being sheer and precipitous instead of smooth and rounded. Enfadus saw us looking at them and volunteered a remark. The road ends there, he said, pointing to the mountains, known among the Kukuanas as the Three Witches. "'Why does it end?' I asked. "'Who knows?' he answered with a shrug. "'The mountains are full of caves, and there is a great pit between them. "'It is there that the wise men of old time used to go "'to get whatever it was they came for to this country, "'and it is there now that our kings are buried in the place of death.' "'What was it they came for?' I asked eagerly. Nay, I know not. My lords who have dropped from the stars should know, he answered with a quick look. Evidently he knew more than he chose to say. Yes, I went on, you are right. In the stars we learn many things. I have heard, for instance, that the wise men of old came to these mountains to find bright stones, pretty playthings, and yellow iron. My lord is wise, he answered coldly, I am but a child and cannot talk with my lord on such matters. My lord must speak with Gagool the old at the king's place, who is wise even as my lord. And he went away. So soon as he was gone, I turned to the others and pointed out the mountains. There are Solomon's diamond mines, I said. Umbopa was standing with them, apparently plunged in one of the fits of abstraction which were common to him, and caught my words. Yes, Makumazan, he put in, in Zulu, the diamonds are surely there, and you shall have them, since you white men are so fond of toys and money. How dost that know that, Umbopa? I asked sharply, for I did not like his mysterious ways. He laughed. I dreamed it in the night, white man. Then he too turned on his heel and went. 
"'Now what?' said Sir Henry. "'Is our black friend driving at? "'He knows more than he chooses to say, that is clear. "'By the way, Quartermain, has he heard anything of... "'of my brother?' "'Nothing. He has asked everyone he has become friendly with, "'but they all declare that no white man has ever been seen in the country before. "'Do you suppose that he got here at all?' suggested Good. "'We have only reached the place by a miracle. "'Is it likely he could have reached it without the map?' "'I don't know,' said Sir Henry gloomily, "'but somehow I think that I shall find him.' Slowly the sun sank, then suddenly darkness rushed down on the land like a tangible thing. There was no breathing space between the day and night, no soft transformation scene, for in these latitudes twilight does not exist. The change from day to night is as quick and as absolute as the change from life to death. The sun sank and the world was wreathed in shadows. But not for long, for, see in the west there is a glow, then come rays of silver light, and at last the full and glorious moon lights up the plain, and shoots its gleaming arrows far and wide, filling the earth with a faint refulgence. We stood and watched the lovely sight, whilst the stars grew pale before this chastened majesty, and felt our hearts lifted up in the presence of a beauty that I cannot describe. Mine has been a rough life, but there are a few things I am thankful to have lived for, and one of them is to have seen that moon shine over Kukuanaland. Presently our meditations were broken in upon by our polite friend Infadus. If my lords are rested, we will journey on to Lu where a hut is made ready for my lords to-night. The moon is now bright, so that we shall not fall by the way. We assented, and in an hour's time were at the outskirts of the town, of which the extent, mapped out as it was by thousands of campfires, appeared absolutely endless. Indeed, Good, who is always fond of a bad joke, christened it Unlimited Lou. Soon we came to a moat with a drawbridge, where we were met by the, the rattling of arms and the horse challenge of a sentry. Infadus gave some password that I could not catch, which was met with a salute, and we passed on through the central street of the great grass city. After nearly half an hour's tramp, past endless lines of huts, Infadus halted at last, by the gate of a little group of huts which surrounded a small courtyard of powdered limestone, and informed us that these were to be our poor quarters. We entered and found that a hut had been assigned to each of us. These huts were superior to any that we had yet seen, and in each was a most comfortable bed made of tanned skins, spread upon mattresses of aromatic grass. Food, too, was ready for us, and so soon as we had washed ourselves with water, which stood ready in earthenware jars, some young women of handsome appearance brought us roasted meats and mealy cobs daintily served on wooden platters, and presented them to us with deep obeisances. We ate and drank, and then, the beds having been all moved into one hut by our request, a precaution at which the amiable young ladies smiled, we flung ourselves down to sleep, thoroughly wearied with our long journey. When we woke, it was to find the sun high in the heavens, and the female attendants, who did not seem to be troubled by any false shame, already standing inside the hut, having been ordered to attend and help us to make ready. Make ready, indeed! growled good when one has only a flannel shirt and a pair of trousers that does not take long i wish you would ask them for my trousers quartermain i asked accordingly but was informed that these sacred relics had already been taken to the king who would see us in the forenoon 
somewhat to their astonishment and disappointment, having requested the young ladies to step outside, we proceeded to make the best toilet of which the circumstances admitted. Good even went the length of again shaving the right side of his face. The left, on which now appeared a very fair crop of whiskers, we impressed upon him he must on no account touch. As for ourselves, we were content with a good wash and combing our hair. Sir Henry's yellow locks were now almost upon his shoulders, and he looked more like an ancient Dane than ever, while my grizzled scrub was fully an inch long instead of half an inch, which is the general way I considered my maximum length. By the time that we had eaten our breakfast and smoked a pipe, a message was brought to us by no less a personage than Enfadus himself that Twala the king was ready to see us, if we would be pleased to come. We remarked in reply that we should prefer to wait till the sun was a little higher. We were yet weary with our journey, etc., etc. It is always well, when dealing with uncivilized people, not to be in too great a hurry. They are apt to mistake politeness for awe or servility. So, although we were quite as anxious to see Twala as Twala could be to see us, we sat down and waited for an hour, employing the interval in preparing such presents as our slender stock of goods permitted, namely, the Winchester rifle, which had been used by poor Ventvogel, and some beads. The rifle and ammunition we determined to present to His Royal Highness, and the beads were for his wives and courtiers. We had already given a few to Infadus and Skraga, and found that they were delighted with them, never having seen such things before. At length we declared that we were ready, and guided by Infadus, started off to the audience, Umbopa carrying the rifle and beads. After walking a few hundred yards, we came to an enclosure, something like that surrounding the huts which had been allotted to us, only fifty times as big, for it could not have covered less than six or seven acres of ground. All round the outside fence stood a row of huts which were the habitations of the king's wives. Exactly opposite the gateway, on the further side of the open space, was a very large hut, built by itself, in which His Majesty resided. All the rest was open ground, that is to say, it would have been open, had it not been filled by company after company of warriors, who were mustered there to the number of seven or eight thousand. These men stood still as statues as we advanced through them, and it would be impossible to give an adequate idea of the grandeur of the spectacle which they presented with their waving plumes, their glancing spears, and iron-backed ox-hide shields. The space in front of the large hut was empty, but before it were placed several stools. On three of these, at a sign from Infadus, we seated ourselves, Umbopa standing behind us. As for Infadus, he took up a position by the door of the hut, so we waited for ten minutes or more in the midst of a dead silence, but conscious that we were the object of the concentrated gaze of some eight thousand pairs of eyes. It was a somewhat trying ordeal, but we carried it off as best we could. At length the door of the hut opened, and a gigantic figure, with a splendid tiger-skin caross flung over its shoulders, stepped out, followed by the boy Scraga, and what appeared to us to be a withered-up monkey wrapped in a fur cloak. The figure seated itself upon a stool. Scraga took his stand behind it, and the withered-up monkey crept on all fours into the shade of the hut and squatted down. Still there was silence. Then the gigantic figure slipped off the caross and stood up before us, a truly alarming spectacle. It was that of an enormous man, with the most entirely repulsive countenance we had ever beheld. This man's lips were as thick as a negro's. The nose was flat. 
He had but one gleaming black eye, for the other was represented by a hollow in the face, and his whole expression was cruel and sensual to a degree. From the large head rose a magnificent plume of white ostrich feathers. His body was clad in a shirt of shining chain armor, whilst round the waist and right knee were the usual garnishes of white oxtail. In his right hand was a huge spear, about the neck a thick torque of gold, and bound on the forehead shone dully a single and enormous uncut diamond. Still there was silence, but not for long. Presently the man, whom we rightly guessed to be the king, raised the great javelin in his hand. Instantly eight thousand spears were lifted in answer, and from eight thousand throats rang out the royal salute of Kum. Three times this was repeated, and each time the earth shook with the noise that can only be compared to the deepest notes of thunder. Be humble, O people, piped out a thin voice, which seemed to come from the monkey in the shade. It is the king. It is the king, boomed out the eight thousand throats in answer. Be humble, O people, it is the king. Then there was a silence again, dead silence. Presently, however, it was broken. A soldier on our left dropped his shield, which fell with a clatter onto the limestone flooring. Twala turned his one cold eye in the direction of the noise. "'Come hither, thou,' he said in a cold voice. A fine young man stepped out of the ranks and stood before him. "'It was thy shield that fell, thou awkward dog. Wilt thou make me a reproach in the eyes of these strangers from the stars? What hast thou to say for thyself?' we saw the poor fellow turn pale under his dusty skin. It was by chance, O calf of the black cow, he murmured. Then it is a chance for which thou must pay. Thou hast made me foolish. Prepare for death. I am the king's ox, was the low answer. Scraga, roared the king, let me see how thou canst use thy spear. Kill me, this blundering fool. Scraga stepped forward with an ill-favored grin and lifted his spear. The poor victim covered his eyes with his hand and stood still. As for us, we were petrified with horror. Once, twice, he waved the spear and then struck. Ah, right home! The spear stood out a foot behind the soldier's back. He flung up his hands and dropped dead. From the multitude about us rose something like a murmur. It rolled round and round and died away. The tragedy was finished. There lay the corpse, and we had not yet realized that it had been enacted. Sir Henry sprang up and swore a great oath, then, overpowered by the sense of silence, sat down again. The thrust was a good one, said the king. Take him away. Four men stepped out of the ranks, and lifting the body of the murdered man, carried it thence. Cover up the blood stains, cover them up, piped out the thin voice that proceeded from the monkey-like figure. The king's word is spoken. The king's doom is done. Thereupon a girl came forward from behind the hut, bearing a jar filled with powdered lime, which she scattered over the red mark, blotting it from sight. Sir Henry, meanwhile, was boiling with rage at what had happened. Indeed, it was with difficulty that we could keep him still. "'Sit down, for heaven's sake,' I whispered. "'Our lives depend on it.' He yielded and remained quiet. Twala sat silent until the traces of the tragedy had been removed. Then he addressed us. White people, he said, who come hither, whence I know not, and why I know not, greeting. Greeting, Twala, king of the Kukuanas, I answered. White people, 
Whence come ye, and what seek ye? We come from the stars, ask us not how, we come to see this land. Ye journey from far to see a little thing, and that man with you, pointing to Umbopa, does he also come from the stars? Even so, there are people of thy color in the heavens above, but ask not of matters too high for thee, Twala the king. Ye speak with a loud voice, people of the stars, Twala answered in a tone which I scarcely liked. Remember that the stars are far off, and ye are here. How if I make you as him whom they bore away? I laughed out loud, though there was little laughter in my heart. O king, I said, be careful, walk warily over hot stones, lest thou shouldst burn thy feet. Hold the spear by the handle, lest thou should cut thy hands. Touch but one hair of our heads, and destruction shall come upon thee. What, have not these, pointing to Enfadus and Scraga, who, young villain that he was, was employed in cleaning the blood of the soldier off his spear. Told thee what manner of men we are, hast thou seen the like of us? And I pointed to good, feeling quite sure that he had never seen anybody before who looked in the least like him, as he then appeared. It is true I have not, said the king, surveying good with interest. Have they not told thee how we strike with death from afar? I went on. They have told me, but I believe them not. Let me see you kill. Kill me a man among those who stand yonder. And he pointed to the opposite side of the corral. And I will believe. Nay, I answered, we shed no blood of men except in just punishment. But if thou wilt see, bid thy servants drive it an ox through the corral gates. And before he has run twenty paces, I will strike him dead. Nay, laughed the king, kill me a man, and I will believe. Good, O king, so be it, I answered coolly. Do thou walk across the open space, and before thy feet reach the gate, thou shalt be dead. Or if thou wilt not, send thy son, Scraga, whom at the moment it would have given me much pleasure to shoot. On hearing this suggestion, Scraga uttered a sort of howl and bolted into the hut. Twala frowned majestically. The suggestion did not please him. Let a young ox be driven in, he said. Two men at once departed, running swiftly. Now, Sir Henry, said I, do you shoot. I want to show this ruffian that I am not the only magician of the party. Sir Henry accordingly took his express and made ready. I hope I shall make a good shot, he groaned. You must, I answered. If you miss with the first barrel, let him have the second. Sight for a hundred and fifty yards, and wait till the beast turns broadside on. Then came a pause, until presently we caught sight of an ox running straight for the corral gate. It came on through the gate, then catching sight of the vast concourse of people stopped stupidly, turned round, and bellowed. "'Now's your time,' I whispered. Up went the rifle. Bang! Thud, and the ox was kicking on his back, shot in the ribs. The semi-hollow bullet had done its work well, and a sigh of astonishment went up from the assembled thousands. I turned round coolly. "'Have I lied, O king?' "'Nay, white man, it is the truth,' was the somewhat awed answer. "'Listen, Twala,' I went on, "'thou hast seen. "'Now know we come in peace, not in war. "'See,' and I held up the Winchester repeater, "'here is a hollow staff that shall enable thee to kill, even as we kill. "'Only I lay this charm upon it. "'Thou shalt kill no man with it. "'If thou liftest it against a man,' It shall kill thee. Stay, I will show thee. Bid a soldier step forty paces and place the shaft of a spear in the ground so that the flat blade looks towards us. In a few seconds it was done. 
Now, see, I will break yonder spear. Taking a careful sight, I fired. The bullet struck the flat of the spear and shattered the blade into fragments. Again the sigh of astonishment went up. Now, Twala, we give this magic tube to thee, and by and by I will show thee how to use it. But beware how thou turnest the magic of the stars against a man of earth. And I handed him the rifle. The king took it very gingerly and laid it down at his feet. As he did so, I observed the wizened monkey-like figure creeping from the shadow of the hut. It crept on all fours, but when it reached the place where the king sat, it rose upon its feet, and throwing the furry covering from its face revealed a most extraordinary and weird countenance. Apparently it was that of a woman of great age, so shrunken that in size it seemed no larger than the face of a year-old child, although made up of a number of deep and yellow wrinkles. Set in these wrinkles was a sunken slit that represented the mouth beneath which the chin curved outwards to a point. There was no nose to speak of. Indeed, the visage might have been taken for that of a sun-dried corpse, had it not been for a pair of large black eyes, still full of fire and intelligence, which gleamed and played under the snow-white eyebrows, and the projecting parchment-colored skull, like jewels in a charnel house. As for the head itself, it was perfectly bare, and yellow in hue, while its wrinkled scalp moved and contracted like the hood of a cobra. The figure to which this fearful countenance belonged, a countenance so fearful indeed that it caused a shiver of fear to pass through us as we gazed at it, stood still for a moment. Then suddenly it projected a skinny claw armed with nails nearly an inch long, and laying it on the shoulder of Twala the king, began to speak in a thin and piercing voice. Listen, O king, listen, O warriors, listen, O mountains and plains and rivers, home of the Kukuana race, listen, O skies and sun, O rain and storm and mist, listen, O men and women, O youths and maidens, and O ye babes unborn, listen, all things that live and must die. Listen, all dead things that shall live again, again to die. Listen, the spirit of life is in me, and I prophesy, I prophesy, I prophesy. The words died away in a faint wail, and dread seemed to seize upon the hearts of all who heard them, including our own. This old woman was very terrible. Blood, 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 rivers of blood, blood everywhere. I see it, I smell it, I taste it. It is salt. It runs red upon the ground. It rains down from the skies. Footsteps, footsteps, footsteps. The tread of the white man coming from afar. It shakes the earth. The earth trembles before her master. Blood is good. The red blood is bright. There is no smell like the smell of new-shed blood. The lions shall lap it and roar. The vultures shall wash their wings in it and shriek with joy. I am old. I am old. I have seen much blood. <laughs> but I shall see more ere I die and be merry. How old am I, think ye? Your fathers knew me, and their fathers knew me, and their fathers' fathers' fathers. I have seen the white man and know his desires. I am old, but the mountains are older than I. Who made the great road, tell me? Who wrote the pictures on the rocks, tell me? Who reared up the three silent ones yonder that gaze across the pit, tell me? And she pointed towards the three precipitous mountains which we had noticed on the previous night. Ye know not, but I know. It was the white people who were here before ye are. Who shall be here when ye are not? who shall eat you up and destroy you. Yea, yea, yea. And what came they for, the white ones, the terrible ones, the skilled in magic and all learning, the strong, the unswerving? What is that bright stone upon thy forehead, O king? 
Whose hands made the iron garment upon thy breast, O king? Ye know not, but I know. I, the old one, I, the wise one, I, the Isanusi, the witch doctress. Then she turned her bald vulture head towards us. What seek ye, white men of the stars? Ah, yes, of the stars. Do ye seek a lost one? Ye shall not find him here. He is not here. Never for ages upon ages has a white foot pressed this land. Never except once, and I remember that he left it but to die. Ye come for bright stones. I know it. I know it. Ye shall find them when the blood is dry. But ye shall return whence ye came. Or shall ye stop with me? <laughs> and thou, thou with the dark skin and the proud bearing. And she pointed her skinny finger at Umbopa. Who art thou? And what seekest thou? Not stones that shine, not yellow metal that gleams. These thou leavest to white men from the stars. Methinks I know thee. Methinks I can smell the smell of the blood in thy heart. Strip off thy girdle. Here the features of this extraordinary creature became convulsed, and she fell to the ground, foaming in an epileptic fit, and was carried into the hut. The king rose up trembling and waved his hand. Instantly the regiments began to file off, and in ten minutes, save for ourselves, the king, and a few attendants, the great space was left empty. White people, he said, it passes in my mind to kill you. Gagool has spoken strange words, what say ye? I laughed. Be careful, O king, we are not easy to slay. Thou hast seen the fate of the ox. Wouldst thou be as the ox is? The king frowned. It is not well to threaten the king. We threaten not, we speak what is true. Try to kill us, O king, and learn. The great savage put his hand to his forehead and thought. Go in peace, he said at length. Tonight is the great dance. Ye shall see it. Fear not that I shall set a snare for you. Tomorrow I will think. It is well, O king, I answered unconcernedly, and then, accompanied by Infadus, we rose and went back to our corral. End of chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 10 The Witch Hunt On reaching our tent, I motioned to Infadus to enter with us. Now, Infadus, I said, we would speak with thee. But my lord, say on. It seems to us, Infadus, that Twala the king is a cruel man. It is so, my lords. Alas, the land cries out because of his cruelties. Tonight you shall see. It is the great witch hunt, and many will be smelt out as wizards and slain. No man's life is safe. If the king covets a man's cattle or a man's wife, or if he fears a man that he should excite a rebellion against him, then Gagool, whom he saw, or some of the witch-finding women whom she has taught, will smell that man out as a wizard, and he will be killed. Many must die before the moon grows pale tonight. It is ever so. Perhaps I too shall be killed. As yet... I have been spared because I am skilled in war and am beloved by the soldiers, but I know not how long I have to live. The land groans at the cruelties of Twala the king. It is wearied of him and his red ways. Then why is it, Infadus, that the people do not cast him down? Nay, my lords, he is the king, and if he were killed, Scraga would reign in his place. 
and the heart of Scragga is blacker than the heart of Twala, his father. If Scragga were king, his yoke upon our neck would be heavier than the yoke of Twala. If Imotu had never been slain, or if Ignosi, his son, had lived, it might have been otherwise. But they are both dead. How knowest thou that Ignosi is dead? said a voice behind us. We looked round, astonished, to see who spoke. It was Umbopa. "'What meanest thou, boy?' asked Infadus. "'Who told thee to speak?' "'Listen, Infadus,' was the answer, "'and I will tell thee a story. "'Years ago the king Imotu was killed in this country, "'and his wife fled with the boy Ignosi. "'Is it not so?' "'It is so.' It was said that the woman and her son died upon the mountains. Is it not so? It is even so. Well, it came to pass that the mother and the boy Ignosi did not die. They crossed the mountains and were led by a tribe of wandering desert men across the sands beyond, till at last they came to water and grass and trees again. How knowest thou this? Listen, they traveled on and on, many months' journey, till they reached a land where a people called the Amazulu, who are also of the Kukuana stock, lived by war, and with them they tarried many years, till at length the mother died. Then the son Ignosi became a wanderer again, and journeyed into a land of wonders, where white people live, and for many more years, he learned the wisdom of the white people. It is a pretty story, said Infadus incredulously. For years he lived there, working as a servant and a soldier, but holding in his heart all that his mother had told him of his own place, and casting about in his mind to find how he might journey thither to see his people and his father's house before he died. For long years he lived and waited, and at last the time came, as it ever comes to him who can wait for it, and he met some white men who would seek this unknown land, and joined himself to them. The white men started and traveled on and on, seeking for one who was lost. They crossed the burning desert, they crossed the snow-clad mountains, and at last reached the land of the Kukuanas, and there they found thee, O Infadus. Surely thou art mad to talk thus, said the astonished old soldier. Thou thinkest so. See, I will show thee, O my uncle. I am Ignosi, rightful king of the Kukuanas. Then with a single movement Umbopa slipped off his muka or girdle, and stood naked before us. Look, he said, what is this? And he pointed to the picture of a great snake, tattooed in blue, round his middle, its tail disappearing into its open mouth, just above where the thighs are set into the body. Infadus looked, his eyes starting nearly out of his head. Then he fell upon his knees. Coom, coom! he ejaculated. It is my brother's son. It is the king. Did I not tell thee so, my uncle? Rise. I am not yet the king, but with thy help, and with the help of these brave white men, who are my friends, I shall be. Yet the old witch Gagul was right. The land shall run with blood first, and hers shall run with it, if she has any and can die, for she killed my father with her words, and drove my mother forth. And now, Infadus, choose now. Will thou put thy hands between my hands and be my man? Will thou share the dangers that lie before me, and help me to overthrow this tyrant and murderer? Or will thou not? Choose thou. The old man put his hand to his head and thought, then he rose, and advancing to where Umbopa, or rather Ignosi, stood, he knelt before him and took his hand. 
Ignosi, rightful king of the Cucuanas, I put my hand between thy hands, and am thy man till death. When thou wast a babe, I dandled thee upon my knees. Now shall my old arm strike for thee and freedom. It is well, Infadus. If I conquer, thou shalt be the greatest man in the kingdom, after the king. If I fail, thou canst only die, and death is not far off from thee. Rise, my uncle. And ye, ye white men, will ye help me? What have I to offer you? The white stones. If I conquer and can find them, ye shall have as many as ye can carry hence. Will that suffice you? I translated this remark. Tell him, answered Sir Henry, that he mistakes an Englishman. Wealth is good, and if it comes in our way, we will take it. But a gentleman does not sell himself for wealth. Still, speaking for myself, I say this. I have always liked Umbopa, and so far as lies in me, I will stand by him in this business. It will be very pleasant to me to try to square matters with that cruel devil Twala. What do you say, good, and you, Quartermain? Well, said Good, to adopt the language of hyperbole, in which all these people seem to indulge, you can tell that a row is surely good, and warms the cockles of the heart, and that so far as I am concerned, I am his boy. My only stipulation is that he allows me to wear trousers. I translated the substance of these answers. It is well, my friends, said Ignosi, late Umbopa. And what sayest thou, Macumazan? Art thou also with me, old hunter, cleverer than a wounded buffalo? I thought a while and scratched my head. Umbopa, or Ignosi, I said, I don't like revolutions. I am a man of peace and a bit of a coward. Here Umbopa smiled. But on the other hand, I stick up for my friends, Ignosi. You have stuck to us and played the part of a man, and I will stick by you. But mind you, I am a trader and have to make my living, so I accept your offer about those diamonds in case we should ever be in position to avail ourselves of it. Another thing, we came, as you know, to look for Inkubu, Sir Henry's lost brother. You must help us to find him. That I will do answered Ignosi. Stay, Infadus, by the sign of the snake about my middle, tell me the truth. Has any white man, to thy knowledge, set his foot within the land? None, O oh, Ignosi. If any white man had been seen or heard of, wouldst thou have known? I should certainly have known. Thou hearest, Inkubu, said Ignosi to Sir Henry. He has not been here. Well, well, said Sir Henry with a sigh. There it is. I suppose that he never got so far. Poor fellow, poor fellow. So it has all been for nothing. God's will be done. Now for business, I put in, anxious to escape from a painful subject. It is very well to be a king by right divine, Ignosi, but how does thou propose to become a king indeed? Nay, I know not, Infadus. Hast thou a plan? Ignosi, son of the lightning, answered his uncle. Tonight is the great dance and witch hunt. Many shall be smelt out and perish, and in the hearts of many others there will be grief and anguish and fury against the king Twala. When the dance is over, then I will speak to some of the great chiefs, who in turn, if I can win them over, will speak to their regiments. I shall speak to the chiefs softly at first, and bring them to see that thou art indeed the king. 
and I think that by tomorrow's light thou shalt have twenty thousand spears at thy command. And now I must go and think, and hear, and make ready. After the dance is done, if I am yet alive, and we are all alive, I will meet thee here, and we can talk. At best there must be war. At this moment our conference was interrupted by the cry that messengers had come from the king. Advancing to the door of the hut, we ordered that they should be admitted, and presently three men entered, each bearing a shining shirt of chain armor and a magnificent battle axe. "'The gifts of my lord, the king, to the white men from the stars,' said a herald who came with them. "'We thank the king,' I answered. "'Withdraw.' "'The men went, and we examined the armor with great interest. "'It was the most wonderful chain work that either of us had ever seen. "'A whole coat fell together so closely that it formed a mass of links, "'scarcely too big to be covered with both hands.' "'Do you make these things in this country, in Fadus? I asked. "'They are very beautiful.' "'Nay, my lord, they came down to us from our forefathers. "'We know not who made them, and there are but few left.' "'Editor's Note. "'In the Sudan, swords and coats of mail are still worn by Arabs "'whose ancestors must have stripped them from the bodies of crusaders.' None but those of royal blood may be clad in them. They are magic coats through which no spear can pass, and those who wear them are well nigh safe in the battle. The king is well pleased, or much afraid, or he would not have sent these garments of steel. Clothe yourselves in them tonight, my lords. The remainder of that day we spent quietly, "'resting and talking over the situation, which was sufficiently exciting. "'At last the sun went down, the thousand watchfires glowed out, "'and through the darkness we heard the tramp of many feet "'and the clashing of hundreds of spears "'as the regiments passed to their appointed places "'to be ready for the great dance. "'Then the full moon shone out in splendor, "'and as we stood watching her rays, Infadus arrived, clad in his war dress, and accompanied by a guard of twenty men to escort us to the dance. As he recommended, we had already donned the shirts of chain armor which the king had sent us, putting them on under our ordinary clothing, and finding to our surprise that they were neither very heavy nor uncomfortable. These steel shirts, which evidently had been made for men of a very large stature, "'hung somewhat loosely upon Good and myself, "'but Sir Henry's fitted his magnificent frame like a glove. "'Then, strapping our revolvers round our waists "'and taking in our hands the battle-axes "'which the king had sent with the armor, we started. "'On arriving at the great corral, "'where we had that morning been received by the king, we found that it was closely packed with some 20,000 men arranged round it in regiments. These regiments were, in turn, divided into companies, and between each company ran a little path to allow space for the witch-finders to pass up and down. Anything more imposing than the sight that was presented by this vast and orderly concourse of armed men, it is impossible to conceive. There they stood, perfectly silent, and the moon poured her light upon the forest of their raised spears, upon their majestic forms, waving plumes, and the harmonious shading of their various colored shields. Wherever we looked were line upon line of dim faces surrounded by range upon range of shimmering spears. Surely, I said to Enfadus, the whole army is here. "'Nay, Macumazan, he answered, "'but a third of it. "'One third is present at this dance each year. "'Another third is mustered outside "'in case there should be trouble when the killing begins. Ten thousand more garrison the outposts round Lou. 
and the rest watch at the corrals in the country. Thou seest it is a great people. They are very silent, said Good, and indeed the intense stillness among such a vast concourse of living men was almost overpowering. What says Buguan? asked Infadus. I translated. Those over whom the shadow of death is hovering are silent, he answered grimly. Will many be killed? Very many. It seems, I said to the others, that we are going to assist at a gladiatorial show arranged regardless of expense. Sir Henry shivered, and Good said that he wished we could get out of it. Tell me, I asked Infadus, are we in danger? I know not, my lords, I trust not. But do not seem afraid. If ye live through the night, all may go well with you. The soldiers murmur against the king. All this while we had been advancing steadily towards the center of the open space, in the midst of which were placed some stools. As we proceeded, we perceived another small party coming from the direction of the royal hut. It is the king, Twala, Scraga, his son, and Gagul, the old. And see, with them are those who slay, said Infadus, pointing to a little group of about a dozen gigantic and savage-looking men, armed with spears in one hand, and heavy carries in the other. The king seated himself upon the center stool. Gagool crouched at his feet, and the other stood behind him. "'Greeting, white lords,' Twala cried as we came up. "'Be seated. Waste not precious time. The night is all too short for the deeds that must be done. Ye come in a good hour.' and shall see a glorious show. Look round, white lords, look round, and he rolled his one wicked eye from regiment to regiment. Can the stars show you such a sight as this? See how they shake in their wickedness, all those who have evil in their hearts, and fear the judgment of heaven above. Begin, begin, piped Gagool in her thin, piercing voice. The hyenas are hungry. They howl for food. Begin, begin. For a moment there was intense stillness, made horrible by a presage of what was to come. The king lifted his spear, and suddenly twenty thousand feet were raised, as though they belonged to one man, and brought down with a stamp upon the earth. This was repeated three times, causing the solid ground to shake and tremble. Then from a far point of the circle a solitary voice began a wailing song, of which the refrain ran something as follows. What is the lot of man born of women? Back came the answer rolling out from every throat in that vast company. Death. Gradually, however, the song was taken up by company after company till the whole armed multitude were singing it and I could no longer follow the words except in so far as they appeared to represent various phases of human passions, fears, and joys. Now it seemed to be a love song, now a majestic swelling war chant, and last of all a death dirge ending suddenly in one heart-breaking wail that went echo and rolling away in a volume of blood-curdling sound. Again silence fell upon the place, and again it was broken by the king lifting his hand. Instantly we heard a pattering of feet, and from out of the masses of warriors strange and awful figures appeared running towards us. As they drew near we saw that these were women, most of them aged, for their white hair, ornamented with small bladders taken from fish, streamed out behind them. Their faces were painted in stripes of white and yellow. Down their backs hung snake skins, and round their waists rattled circlets of human bones, while each held a small forked wand in her shriveled hand. 
In all there were ten of them. When they arrived in front of us, they halted, and one of them, pointing with her wand towards the crouching figure of Gagool, cried out, "'Mother, old oh mother, we are here!' "'Good, good, good,' answered that aged iniquity. "'Are your eyes keen, Isanusis, witch doctresses, ye seers in dark places? "'Mother, they are keen. Good, good, good. "'Are your ears open, Isanusis, ye who hear words that come not from the tongue? "'Mother, they are open.' Good, good, good. Are your senses awake, Isanusis? Can ye smell blood? Can ye purge the land of the wicked ones who compass evil against the king and against their neighbors? Are ye ready to do justice of heaven above, ye whom I have taught, who have eaten of the bread of my wisdom and drunk of the water of my magic? Mother, we can. Then go. "'Tarry not, ye vultures! "'See, the slayers,' pointing to the ominous group of executioners behind. "'Make sharp their spears. "'The white men from afar are hungry to see. "'Go!' "'With a wild yell, Gagool's horrid ministers broke away in every direction, "'like fragments from a shell, "'the dry bones round their waists rattling as they ran.' and headed for various points of the dense human circle. We could not watch them all, so we fixed our eyes upon the Isanusi nearest to us. When she came to within a few paces of the warriors, she halted and began to dance wildly, turning round and round with an almost incredible rapidity, and shrieking out sentences such as, I smell him, the evil doer! He is near, he who poisoned his mother. I hear the thoughts of him who thought evil of the king. Quicker and quicker she danced, till she lashed herself into such a frenzy of excitement that the foam flew in specks from her gnashing jaws, till her eyes seemed to start from her head and her flesh to quiver visibly. Suddenly she stopped dead and stiffened all over like a pointed dog when he scents game. And then, with outstretched wand, she began to creep stealthily towards the soldiers before her. It seemed to us that as she came their stoicism gave way, and that they shrank from her. As for ourselves, we followed her movements with a horrible fascination. Presently, still creeping and crouching like a dog, the Isanusi was before them. Then she halted and pointed, and again crept on a pace or two. Suddenly the end came. With a shriek, she sprang in and touched a tall warrior with her forked wand. Instantly, two of his comrades, those standing immediately next to him, seized the doomed man, each by one arm, and advanced with him towards the king. He did not resist, but we saw that he dragged his limbs as though they were paralyzed, and that his fingers, from which the spear had fallen, were limp like those of a man newly dead. As he came, two of the villainous executioners stepped forward to meet him. Presently they met, and the executioners turned round, looking towards the king as though for orders. "'Kill,' said the king." Kill! squeaked Gagool. Kill! re echoed Scraga with a hollow chuckle. Almost before the words were uttered, the horrible deed was done. One man had driven his spear into the victim's heart, and to make assurance double sure, the other had dashed out his brains with a great club. One counted Twala the king, just like a black Madame Defarge, as Good said and the body was dragged a few paces away and stretched out. Hardly was the thing done before another poor wretch was brought up like an ox to the slaughter. This time we could see, from the leopard-skin cloak which he wore, that the man was a victim of rank. Again the awful syllables were spoken, 
and the victim fell. Two, counted the king. And so the deadly game went on, till about a hundred bodies were stretched in rows behind us. I have heard of the gladiatorial shows of the Caesars, and of the Spanish bullfights, but I take the liberty of doubting if either of them could be half so horrible as this Cucuana witch hunt. Gladiatorial shows and Spanish bullfights, at any rate, contributed to the public amusement, which certainly was not the case here. The most confirmed sensation monger would fight shy of sensation if he knew that it was well on the cards that he would, in his own proper person, be the subject of the next event. Once we rose and tried to remonstrate, but were sternly repressed by Twala. Let the law take its course, white men. These dogs are magicians and evildoers. It is well that they should die, was the only answer vouchsafed to us. About half past ten there was a pause. The witch finders gathered themselves together, apparently exhausted with their bloody work, and we thought that the performance was done with. But it was not so, for presently, to our surprise, the ancient woman, Gagool, rose from her crouching position, and supporting herself with a stick, staggered off into the open space. It was an extraordinary sight to see this frightful, vulture-headed old creature, bent nearly double with extreme age, gather strength by degrees, until at last she rushed about almost as actively as her ill-omened pupils. To and fro she ran, chanting to herself, till suddenly she made a dash at a tall man standing in front of one of the regiments and touched him. As she did this, a sort of groan went up from the regiment, which evidently he commanded. But two of its officers seized him all the same and brought him up for execution. We learned afterwards that he was a man of great wealth and importance, being indeed a cousin of the king. He was slain, and Twala counted one hundred and three. Then Gagool again sprang to and fro, gradually drawing nearer and nearer to ourselves. "'Hang me if I don't believe she is going to try her games on us!' ejaculated Good in horror. "'Nonsense,' said Sir Henry. "'As for myself, when I saw that old fiend dancing nearer and nearer, my heart positively sank into my boots.' I glanced behind us at the long row of corpses and shivered. Nearer and nearer waltzed Gagool, looking for all the world like an animated crooked stick or comma, her horrid eyes gleaming and glowing with a most unholy luster. Nearer she came, and yet nearer, every creature in that vast assemblage watching her movements with intense anxiety. At last she stood still and pointed. "'Which is it to be?' asked Sir Henry to himself. In a moment all doubts were at rest, for the old hag had rushed in and touched Umbopa, alias Ignosi, on the shoulder. "'I smell him out!' she shrieked. "'Kill him! Kill him! He is full of evils! Kill him! The stranger! Before blood flows from him!' "'Slay him, O king!' "'There was a pause, of which I instantly took advantage. "'O king,' I called out, rising from my seat, "'this man is the servant of thy guests. "'He is their dog. "'Whosoever sheds the blood of our dog sheds our blood. "'By the sacred law of hospitality I claim protection for him. "'Gagool, mother of the witch-finders, has smelt him out. "'He must die, white men.' was the sullen answer. "'Nay, he shall not die,' I replied. "'He who tries to touch him shall die indeed.' "'Seize him!' roared Twala to the executioners, who stood round red to the eyes with the blood of their victims. They advanced towards us and then hesitated. As for Ignosi, he clutched his spear 
and raised it as though determined to sell his life dearly. "'Stand back, ye dogs!' I shouted. "'If you would see tomorrow's light, touch one hair of his head and your king dies.' And I covered Twala with my revolver. Sir Henry and Good also drew their pistols, Sir Henry pointing his at the leading executioner who was advancing to carry out the sentence, and Good taking a deliberate aim at Gagool. Twala winced perceptibly as my barrel came in a line with his broad chest. Well, I said, what is it to be, Twala? Then he spoke. Put away your magic tubes, he said. Ye have adjured me in the name of hospitality, and for that reason, but not from fear of what ye can do, I spare him. Go in peace. It is well, I answered unconcernedly. We are weary of slaughter and would sleep. Is the dance ahead? It is ended, Twala answered sulkily. Let these dead dogs, pointing to the long row of corpses, be flung out to the hyenas and the vultures. And he lifted his spear. Instantly the regiments began to defile through the corral gateway in perfect silence, a fatigue party only remaining behind to drag away the corpses of those who had been sacrificed. Then we rose also, and making our salam to his majesty, which he hardly deigned to acknowledge, we departed to our huts. Well, said Sir Henry as we sat down, having first lit a lamp of the sort used by the Kukuanas, of which the wick is made from the fiber of a species of palm leaf and the oil from clarified hippopotamus fat. Well, I feel uncommonly inclined to be sick. If I had any doubts about helping Umbopa to rebel against that infernal blackguard, put in good, they are gone now. It was as much as I could do to sit still while that slaughter was going on. I tried to keep my eyes shut, but they would open just at the wrong time. I wonder where Infadus is. Umbopa, my friend, you ought to be grateful to us. Your skin came near to having an air hole made in it. I am grateful, Bugwan, was Umbopa's answer when I had translated. And I shall not forget... As for Infadus, he will be here by and by. We must wait. So we lit our pipes and waited. End of chapter 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 11 We Give a Sign For a long while, two hours I should think, we sat there in silence, being too much overwhelmed by the recollection of the horrors we had seen to talk. At last, just as we were thinking of turning in, drew nigh to dawn, we heard a sound of steps. Then came the challenge of a sentry posted at the corral gate, which apparently was answered, though not in an audible tone, for the steps still advanced, and in another second Infadus had entered the hut, followed by some half-dozen stately-looking chiefs. "'My lords,' he said, I have come according to my word. My lords and Ignosi, rightful king of the Kukuanas, I have brought with me these men, pointing to the row of chiefs, who are great men among us, having each one of them the command of three thousand soldiers that live but to do their bidding under the kings. I have told them of what I have seen and what my ears have heard. Now let them also behold the sacred snake around thee, and hear thy story, Ignosi, that they may say whether or not they will make cause with thee against Twala the king. 
by way of answer, Ignosi again stripped off his girdle, and exhibited the snake tattooed about him. Each chief in turn drew near and examined the sign by the dim light of the lamp, and without saying a word passed on to the other side. Then Ignosi resumed his muka, and addressing them, repeated the history he had detailed in the morning. "'Now ye have heard, chiefs,' said Infadus, when he had done. "'What say ye? Will ye stand by this man and help him to his father's throne, or will ye not? "'The land cries out against Twala, and the blood of the people flows like the waters in spring.' Ye have seen to-night. Two other chiefs there were with whom I had in my mind to speak, and where are they now? The hyenas howl over their corpses. Soon shall ye be as they are if ye strike not. Choose then, my brothers. The eldest of the six men, a short, thick-set warrior with white hair, stepped forward a pace and answered, Thy words are true, Infadus, the land cries out. My own brother is among those who died tonight. But this is a great matter, and the thing is hard to believe. How know we that if we lift our spears it may not be for a thief and a liar? It is a great matter, I say, of which none can see the end. For of this be sure... Blood will flow in rivers before the deed is done. Many will still cleave to the king, for men worship the sun that still shines bright in the heavens rather than that which has not risen. These white men from the stars, their magic is great, and Ignosi is under the cover of their wing. If he be indeed the rightful king, let them give us a sign. And let the people have a sign, that all may see. So shall men cleave to us, knowing of a truth that the white man's magic is with them. Ye have the sign of the snake, I answered. My lord, it is not enough. The snake may have been placed there since the man's childhood. Show us a sign, and it will suffice. "'but we will not move without a sign.' "'The others gave a decided assent, "'and I turned in perplexity to Sir Henry and Good "'and explained the situation. "'I think I have it,' said Good exultingly. "'Ask them to give us a moment to think.' "'I did so, and the chiefs withdrew. "'So soon as they had gone,' Good went to the little box where he kept his medicines, unlocked it, and took out a notebook, in the fly leaves of which was an almanac. Now look here, you fellows. Isn't tomorrow the fourth of June? he answered. We had kept a careful note of the days, so were able to answer that it was. Very good. Then here we have it. Four June. Total eclipse of the moon commences at 8.15 Greenwich time, visible in Tenerife, South Africa, etc. There's a sign for you. Tell them we will darken the moon tomorrow night. The idea was a splendid one. Indeed, the only weak spot about it was a fear lest Good's Almanac might be incorrect. If we made a false prophecy on such a subject, our prestige would be gone forever, and so would Ignosi's chance of the throne of the Cucuanas. Suppose that the almanac is wrong, suggested Sir Henry to Good, who was busily employed in working out something on a blank page of the book. I see no reason to suppose anything of the sort, was his answer. Eclipses always come up to time, at least that is my experience of them, and it especially states that this one will be visible in South Africa. I have worked out the reckonings as well as I can without knowing our exact position, and I make out that the eclipse should begin here about 10 o'clock tomorrow night, and last till half past 12, for an hour and a half or so, 
there should be almost total darkness. Well, said Sir Henry, I suppose we had better risk it. I acquiesced, though doubtfully, for eclipses are queer cattle to deal with. It might be a cloudy night, for instance, or our dates might be wrong, and sent Umbopa to summon the chiefs back. Presently they came, and I addressed them thus. Great men of the Kukuanas, and thou, Infadus, listen. We love not to show our powers, for to do so is to interfere with the course of nature, and to plunge the world into fear and confusion. But since this matter is a great one, and as we are angered against the king because of the slaughter we have seen, and because of the act of the Isanusi, Gagul, who would have put our friend Ignosi to death, we have determined to break a rule, and to give such a sign as all men may see. Come hither, and I led them to the door of the hut and pointed to the red ball of the moon. What see ye there? We see the sinking moon, answered the spokesman of the party. It is so. Now tell me, can any mortal man put out that moon before her hour of setting? and bring the curtain of black light down upon the land. The chief laughed a little at the question. No, my lord, that no man can do. The moon is stronger than man who looks on her, nor can she vary in her course. Ye say so. Yet I tell you that tomorrow night, about two hours before midnight, we will cause the moon to be eaten up, for a space of an hour and half an hour. Yes, deep darkness shall cover the earth, and it shall be for a sign that Ignosi is indeed king of the Kukuanas. If we do this thing, will ye be satisfied? Yea, my lords, answered the old chief with a smile, which was reflected on the faces of his companions. If ye do this thing, we will be satisfied indeed. It shall be done. We three, Inkibu, Bugwan, and Makumazan have said it, and it shall be done. Dost thou hear, Enfadus? I hear, my lord, but it is a wonderful thing that ye promise to put out the moon, the mother of the world, when she is at her full. Yet shall we do it, Infadus. It is well, my lords. Today, two hours after sunset, Twala will send for my lords to witness the girl's dance, and one hour after the dance begins, the girl whom Twala thinks the fairest shall be killed by Scraga, the king's son, as a sacrifice to the silent ones who sit and keep watch by the mountains yonder and he pointed towards the three strange-looking peaks where Solomon's road was supposed to end. Then let my lords darken the moon and save the maiden's life, and the people will believe indeed. Aye, said the old chief, still smiling a little, the people will believe indeed. Two miles from Lu, went on Fadus, there is a hill curved like a new moon, a stronghold, where my regiment, and three other regiments which these chiefs command are stationed this morning we will make a plan whereby two or three other regiments may be moved there also then if in truth my lords can darken the moon in the darkness i will take my lords by the hand and lead them out of loo to this place where they shall be safe and thence we can make war upon twala the king it is good said i let leave us to sleep a while and to make ready our magic. Infadus rose, and having saluted us, departed with the chiefs. My friends, said Ignosi, as soon as they were gone, can ye do this wonderful thing, or were ye speaking empty words to the captains? We believe that we can do it, Umbopa, Ignosi, I mean. It is strange, he answered. And had ye not been Englishmen, I would not have believed it. 
"'but I have learned that English gentlemen tell no lies. "'If we live through the matter, be sure that I will repay you.' "'Ignosi,' said Sir Henry, "'promise me one thing.' "'I will promise, Incubu, my friend, even before I hear it,' "'answered the big man with a smile. "'What is it?' "'This, that if ever you come to be king of this people, "'you will do away with the smelling out of wizards such as we saw last night, "'and that the killing of men without trial shall no longer take place in the land.' "'Ignosi thought for a moment after I had translated this request, "'and then answered, "'The ways of black people are not as the ways of white men, Inkibu nor do we value life so highly. Yet I will promise. If it be in my power to hold them back, the witch-finders shall hunt no more, nor shall any man die the death without trial or judgment. That's a bargain, then, said Sir Henry. And now let us get a little rest. Thoroughly wearied out, we were soon sound asleep, and slept till Ignosi woke us about eleven o'clock. Then we rose, washed, and ate a hearty breakfast. After that we went outside the hut and walked about, amusing ourselves with examining the structure of the Kukuana huts and observing the customs of the women. "'I hope that eclipse will come off,' said Sir Henry presently. "'If it does not, "'It will soon be all up with us,' I answered mournfully. "'For so sure as we are living men, "'some of those chiefs will tell the whole story to the king, "'and then there will be another sort of eclipse, "'and one that we shall certainly not like. "'Returning to the hut, we ate some dinner "'and passed the rest of the day "'in receiving visits of ceremony and curiosity. "'At length the sun set and we enjoyed a couple of hours of such quiet as our melancholy forebodings would allow to us. Finally, about half-past eight, a messenger came from Twala to bid us to the great annual dance of girls which was about to be celebrated. Hastily we put on the chain shirts that the king had sent us, and taking our rifles and ammunition with us, so as to have them handy in case we had to fly, as suggested by Infidus, we started boldly enough, though with inward fear and trembling. The great space in front of the king's corral bore a very different appearance from that which it had presented on the previous evening. In place of the grim ranks of serried warriors were company after company of Kukuana girls, not overdressed, so far as clothing went, but each crowned with a wreath of flowers, and holding a palm leaf in one hand, and a white arum lily in the other. In the center of the open moonlit space sat Twala the king, with old Gagool at his feet, attended by Infidus, the boy Scraga, and twelve guards. There were also present about a score of chiefs, among whom I recognized most of our friends of the night before. Twala greeted us with much apparent cordiality, though I saw him fix his one eye viciously on Umbopa. "'Welcome, white men from the stars,' he said. "'This is another sight from that which your eyes gazed on by the light of last night's moon, but it is not so good a sight. Girls are pleasant, and were it not for such as these,' and he pointed round him, we should none of us be here this day, but men are better. Kisses and the tender words of women are sweet, but the sound of the clashing of the spears of warriors and the smell of men's blood are sweeter far. Would ye have wives from among our people, white men? If so, choose the fairest here, and ye shall have them, as many as ye will. And he paused for an answer. As the prospect did not seem to be without attractions for good, who, like most sailors, is of a susceptible nature, being elderly and wise, foreseeing the endless complications that anything of the sort would involve, 
for women bring trouble so surely as the night follows the day, I put in a hasty answer. Thanks to thee, O king. But we white men wed only with white women like ourselves. Your maidens are fair, but they are not for us. The king laughed. It is well. In our land there is a proverb which runs, Women's eyes are always bright, whatever the color. And another that says, Love her who is present, for be sure she who is absent is false to thee. But perhaps these things are not so in the stars. In a land where men are white, all good things are possible. So be it, white men. The girls will not go begging. Welcome again, and welcome too, thou black one. If Gagool here had won her way, thou wouldst have been stiff and cold by now. It is lucky for thee that thou too camest from the stars. Ha <laughs> ha! I can kill thee before thou killest me, O king, was Ignosi's calm answer, and thou shalt be stiff before my limbs cease to bend. Twala started. Thou speakest boldly, boy, he replied angrily. Presume not too far. He may well be bold in whose lips are truth. The truth is a sharp spear which flies home and misses not. It is a message from the stars, O king. Twala scowled, and his one eye gleamed fiercely, but he said nothing more. Let the dance begin, he cried. And then the flower-crowned girls sprang forward in companies, singing a sweet song and waving the delicate palms and white lilies. On they danced, looking faint and spiritual in the soft, sad light of the risen moon now whirling round and round, now meeting in mimic warfare, swaying, eddying here and there, coming forward, falling back, in an ordered confusion delightful to witness. At last they paused, and a beautiful young woman sprang out of the ranks and began to pirouette in front of us with a grace and vigor which would have put most ballet girls to shame. At length she retired exhausted, and another took her place, then another, and another. But none of them, either in grace, skill, or personal attractions, came up to the first. When the chosen girls had all danced, the king lifted his hand. "'Which deem ye the fairest, white men?' he asked. "'The first, said I, unthinkingly. Next second I regretted it for I remembered that Infadus had told us that the fairest woman must be offered up as a sacrifice. Then is my mind as your minds, and my eyes as your eyes. She is the fairest, and a sorry thing it is for her, for she must die. I must die, piped out Gagool, casting a glance of her quick eyes in the direction of the poor girl, who, as yet ignorant of the awful fate in store for her, was standing some ten yards off in front of a company of maidens, engaged in nervously picking a flower from her wreath to pieces, petal by petal. "'Why, O king,' said I, restraining my indignation with difficulty, "'the girl has danced well and pleased us. She is fair, too. It would be hard to reward her with death.' Twala laughed as he answered, it is our custom, and the figures who sit in the stone yonder, and he pointed towards the three distant peaks, must have their due. Did I fail to put the fairest girl to death today, misfortune would fall upon me in my house. Thus runs the prophecy of my people. If the king offer not a sacrifice of a fair girl on the day of the dance of the maidens, to the old ones who sit and watch on the mountains, then shall he fall, and his house. Look ye, white men, my brother who reigned before me offered not the sacrifice, because of the tears of the woman, and he fell, and his house, and I reign in his stead. It is finished. She must die. Then turning to the guards, bring her hither, Scraga, make sharp thy spear. 
Two of the men stepped forward, and as they advanced, the girl, for the first time realizing her impending fate, screamed aloud and turned to fly. But the strong hands caught her fast and brought her, struggling and weeping, before us. "'What is thy name, girl?' piped Gagool. "'What? Wilt thou not answer? Shall the king's son do his work at once?' At this hint, Scraga, looking more evil than ever, advanced a step and lifted his great spear, and at that moment I saw Good's hand creep to his revolver. The poor girl caught the faint glint of steel through her tears, and it sobered her anguish. She ceased struggling, and clasped her hands convulsively, stood shuddering from head to foot. See, cried Skaga in a high glee, she shrinks from the sight of my little plaything even before she has tasted it. And he tapped the broad blade of his spear. If ever I get the chance, you shall pay for that, you young hound. I heard Good mutter beneath his breath. Now that thou art quiet, give us thy name, my dear. Come, speak out, and fear not, said Gagool in mockery. "'Oh, mother,' answered the girl in trembling accents, "'my name is Fulata of the house of Suko. "'Oh, mother, why must I die? I have done no wrong.' "'Be comforted,' went on the old woman in her hateful tone of mockery. "'Thou must die indeed as a sacrifice to the old ones who sit yonder.' "'And she pointed to the peaks.' "'But it is better to sleep in the night than to toil in the daytime. "'It is better to die than to live, "'and thou shalt die by the royal hand of the king's own son.' "'The girl Fulata wrung her hands in anguish and cried out aloud, "'O oh, cruel, and I so young, "'what have I done that I should never again see the sun rise out of the night, "'or the stars come following on his track in the evening?' that I may no more gather the flowers when the dew is heavy, or listen to the laughing of the waters. Woe is me that I shall never see my father's hut again, nor feel my mother's kiss, nor tend the lamb that is sick. Woe is me that no lover shall put his arm around me and look into my eyes, nor shall men children be born of me. Oh, cruel, cruel! And again she wrung her hands and turned her tear-stained, flower-crowned face to heaven, looking so lovely in her despair, for she was indeed a beautiful woman, that assuredly the sight of her would have melted the hearts of any less cruel than were the three fiends before us. Prince Arthur's appeal to the ruffians who came to blind him was not more touching than that of this savage girl. But it did not move Gagool, or Gagool's master, though I saw signs of pity among the guards behind, and on the faces of the chiefs. And as for good, he gave a fierce snort of indignation, and made a quick motion as though to go to her assistance. With all a woman's quickness, the doomed girl interpreted what was passing in his mind, and by a sudden movement flung herself before him and clasped his beautiful white legs with her hands. "'O oh, white father from the stars,' she cried, "'throw over me the mantle of thy protection. Let me creep into the shadow of thy strength, that I may be saved.' Oh, keep me from these cruel men and from the mercies of Gagool. All right, my hearty, I'll look after you, sang out good and nervous Saxon. Come on, get up, there's a good girl, and he stooped and caught her hand. Twala turned and motioned to his son, who advanced with his spear lifted. Now's your time, whispered Sir Henry to me. What are you waiting for? I am waiting for that eclipse, I answered. I have had my eye on the moon for the last half hour, and I never saw it look healthier. Well, you must risk it now, or the girl will be killed. Twala is losing patience. Recognizing the force of the argument, 
and having cast one more despairing look at the bright face of the moon, for never did the most ardent astronomer with a theory to prove await a celestial event with such anxiety, I stepped with all the dignity that I could command between the prostrate girl and the advancing spear of Scraga. King, I said, it shall not be. We will not endure this thing. Let the girl go in safety. Twala rose from his seat in wrath and astonishment, and from the chiefs and serried ranks of maidens who had closed in slowly upon us in anticipation of the tragedy came a murmur of amazement. Shall not be, thou white dog, that yappest at the lion in his cave, shall not be, art thou mad? Be careful, lest this chicken's fate overtake thee, and those with thee. How canst thou save her or thyself? Who art thou that thou settest thyself between me and my will? Back, I say. Scraga, kill her. No, guards, seize these men. At his cry, armed men ran swiftly from behind the hut, where they had evidently been placed beforehand. Sir Henry, Good, and Umbopa ranged themselves alongside of me and lifted their rifles. Stop! I shouted boldly, though at the moment my heart was in my boots. Stop! We, the white men from the stars, say that it shall not be. Come but one pace nearer, and we will put out the moon like a wind-blown lamp, as we who dwell in her house can do, and plunge the land in darkness. Dare to disobey, and ye shall taste of our magic. My threat produced an effect. The man halted, and Scragga stood still before us, his spear lifted. Hear him! Hear him! piped Gagool. Hear the liar who says that he will put out the moon like a lamp. Let him do it, and the girl shall be speared. Yes, let him do it, or die by the girl, he and those with him. I glanced up at the moon despairingly, and now to my intense joy and relief saw that we, or rather the almanac, had made no mistake. On the edge of the great orb lay a faint rim of shadow, while a smoky hue grew and gathered upon its bright surface. Never shall I forget that supreme, that superb moment of relief. Then I lifted my hand solemnly towards the sky, an example which Sir Henry and Good followed, and quoted a line or two from the Ingoldsby legends at it in the most impressive tones that I could command. Sir Henry followed suit with a verse out of the Old Testament and something about Balbus building a wall in Latin, whilst Good addressed the Queen of Night in a volume of the most classical bad language which he could think of. Slowly the penumbra, the shadow of a shadow, crept on over the bright surface, and as it crept I heard deep gasps of fear rising from the multitude around. Look, O king, I cried, look, Gagool, look, chiefs and people and women, and see if the white men from the stars keep their word, or if they be but empty liars. The moon grows black before your eyes. Soon there will be darkness, ay, darkness in the hour of the full moon. Ye have asked for a sign, it is given to you. Grow dark, O moon. Withdraw thy light, thou pure and holy one. Bring the proud heart of usurping murderers to the dust, and eat up the world with shadows. A groan of terror burst from the onlookers. Some stood petrified with dread. Others threw themselves upon their knees and cried aloud. As for the king, he sat still and turned pale beneath his dusky skin. Only Gagool kept her courage. It will pass, she cried. I have often seen the like before. No man can put out the moon. Lose not heart. Sit still. The shadow will pass. Wait, and ye shall see, I replied, hopping with excitement. O oh, moon, 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 wherefore art thou so cold and fickle? 
This appropriate quotation was from the pages of a popular romance that I chanced to have read recently, though now I come to think of it, it was ungrateful of me to abuse the Lady of the Heavens, who was showing herself to be the truest of friends to us, however she may have behaved to the impassioned lover in the novel. Then I added, Keep it up, good. I can't remember any more poetry. Curse away, there's a good fellow. Good responded nobly to this tax upon his inventive faculties. Never before had I the faintest conception of the breadth and depth and height of a naval officer's objugatory powers. For ten minutes he went on in several languages without stopping, and he scarcely ever repeated himself. Meanwhile the dark ring crept on, while all that great assembly fixed their eyes upon the sky and stared and stared in fascinated silence. Strange and unholy shadows encroached upon the moonlight. An ominous quiet filled the place. Everything grew still as death. Slowly, and in the midst of this most solemn silence, the minutes sped away, and while they sped, the full moon passed deeper and deeper into the shadow of the earth, as the inky segment of its circle slid in awful majesty across the lunar craters. The great pale orb seemed to draw near and to grow in size. She turned a coppery hue, then that portion of her surface which was unobscured as yet grew gray and ashen, and at length, as totality approached, her mountains and her plains were seen to be glowing luridly through a crimson gloom. On, yet on, crept the ring of darkness. It was now more than half across the blood-red orb. The air grew thick and still more deeply tinged with dusky crimson, and yet on, till we could scarcely see the fierce faces of the group before us. No sound rose now from the spectators, and at last good stopped swearing. "'The moon is dying! The white wizards have killed the moon!' yelled the Prince Scraga at last. "'We shall all perish in the dark!' And animated by fear or fury, or by both, he lifted his spear and drove it with all his force at Sir Henry's breast. But he forgot the mail shirts that the king had given us, and which we wore beneath our clothing. The steel rebounded harmless, and before he could repeat the blow, Curtis had snatched the spear from his hand and sent it straight through him. Scragga dropped dead. At the sight, and driven mad with fear of the gathering darkness, and of the unholy shadow which, as they believed, was swallowing the moon, the companies of girls broke up in wild confusion and ran screeching for the gateways. Nor did the panic stop there. The king himself, followed by his guards, some of the chiefs in Gagool, who hobbled away after them with marvelous alacrity, fled for the huts, so that in another minute we ourselves, the would-be victim Fulata, Infadus, and most of the chiefs who had interviewed us on the previous night, were left alone upon the scene together with the dead body of Scraga, Twala's son. Chiefs, I said, we have given you the sign. If ye are satisfied, let us fly swiftly to the place of which she spoke. The charm cannot now be stopped. It will work for an hour and the half of an hour. Let us cover ourselves in the darkness. Come, said Infadus, turning to go an example which was followed by the odd captains, ourselves, and the girl Fulata, whom Good took by the arm. Before we reached the gate of the corral, the moon went out utterly, and from every quarter of the firmament the stars rushed forth into the inky sky. Holding each other by the hand, we stumbled on through the darkness. End of chapter 11 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 12 Before the Battle Luckily for us, Infadus and the chiefs knew all the paths of the great town perfectly, so that we passed by sideways unmolested, and notwithstanding the gloom, we made fair progress. For an hour or more we journeyed on, till at length the eclipse began to pass, and that edge of the moon which had disappeared the first became again visible. Suddenly, as we watched, there burst from it a silver streak of light, accompanied by a wondrous ruddy glow, which hung upon the blackness of the sky like a celestial lamp, and a wild and lovely sight it was. In another five minutes the stars began to fade, and there was sufficient light to see our whereabouts. We then discovered that we were clear of the town of Lu, and approaching a flat-topped hill measuring some two miles in circumference. This hill, which is of a formation common in South Africa, is not very high. Indeed, its greatest elevation is scarcely more than 200 feet. But it is shaped like a horseshoe, and its sides are rather precipitous and strewn with boulders. On the grass tableland at its summit is ample camping ground, which had been utilized as a military cantonment of no mean strength. Its ordinary garrison was one regiment of 3,000 men, but as we toiled up the steep side of that mountain in the returning moonlight, we perceived that there were several of such regiments encamped there. Reaching the tableland at last, we found crowds of men roused from their sleep, shivering with fear, and huddled up together in the utmost consternation at the natural phenomenon which they were witnessing. Passing through these without a word, we gained a hut in the center of the ground, where we were astonished to find two men waiting, laden with our few good and chattels, which of course we had been obliged to leave behind in our hasty flight. I sent for them, explained Infadus, and also for these, and he lifted up Good's long lost trousers. With an exclamation of rapturous delight, Good sprang at them, and instantly proceeded to put them on. "'Surely my lord will not hide his beautiful white legs,' exclaimed Infadus regretfully. But Good persisted, and only once did the Kukuwana people get the chance of seeing his beautiful legs again. Good is a very modest man. Henceforward they had to satisfy their aesthetic longings with his one whisker, his transparent eye, and his movable teeth. Still gazing with fond remembrance at Good's trousers, Infadus next informed us that he had commanded the regiment to muster so soon as the day broke, in order to explain to them fully the origin and circumstances of the rebellion which was decided on by the chiefs, and to introduce to them the rightful heir of the throne, Ignosi. Accordingly, when the sun was up, the troops, in all some twenty thousand men, and the flower of the Kukuana army, were mustered on a large open space to which we went. The men were drawn up in three sides of a dense square, and presented a magnificent spectacle. We took our station on the open side of the square, and were speedily surrounded by all the principal chiefs and officers. These, after silence had been proclaimed, Infadus proceeded to address. He narrated to them in vigorous and graceful language, for like most Kukuanas of high rank, he was a born orator, the history of Ignosi's father, and of how he had been basely murdered by Twala the king, and his wife and child driven out to starve. Then he pointed out that the people suffered and groaned under Twala's cruel rule, instancing the proceedings of the previous night, when under pretense of their being evildoers, many of the noblest in the land had been dragged forth and wickedly done to death. Next he went on to say that the white lords from the stars, looking down upon their country, had perceived its trouble, 
and determined at great personal inconvenience to alleviate its lot, that they had accordingly taken the real king of the Cucuanas, Ignosi, who was languishing in exile, by the hand, and led him over the mountains, that they had seen the wickedness of Twala's doings, and for a sign to the wavering and to save the life of the girl Fulata, actually by the exercise of their high magic, had put out the moon and slain the young fiend Scraga, and that they were prepared to stand by them and assist them to overthrow Twala and set up the rightful king Ignosi in his place. He finished his discourse amidst a murmur of approbation. Then Ignosi stepped forward and began to speak. Having reiterated all that Infadus, his uncle, had said, he concluded a powerful speech in these words, O chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people, ye have heard my words. Now must ye make choice between me and him who sits upon my throne, the uncle who killed his brother, and hunted his brother's child forth to die in the cold and the night. That I am indeed the king, these, pointing to the chiefs, can tell you, for they have seen the snake about my middle. If I were not the king, would these white men be on my side with all their magic? Tremble, chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people. Is not the darkness they have brought upon the land to confound Twala and cover our flight, darkness even in the hour of the full moon, yet before your eyes? It is, answered the soldiers. I am the king, I say to you, I am the king, went on Ignosi, drawing up his great stature to its full, and lifting his broad-bladed battle-axe above his head. If there be any man among you who says that it is not so, let him stand forth, and I will fight him now, and his blood shall be a red token that I tell you true. Let him stand forth, I say. And he shook the great axe till it flashed in the sunlight. As nobody seemed inclined to respond to this heroic version of Dilly Dilly, come and be killed, our late henchman proceeded with his address. I am indeed the king, and should ye stand by my side in the battle, if I win the day, ye shall go with me to victory and honor. I will give you oxen and wives, and ye shall take place of all the regiments, and if ye fall, I will fall with you. And behold, I give you this promise, that when I sit upon the seat of my fathers, bloodshed shall cease in the land. No longer shall ye cry for justice to find slaughter. No longer shall the witch-finder hunt you out so that ye may be slain without a cause. No man shall die, save he who offends against the law. The eating up of your kraals shall cease. Each one of you shall sleep secure in his own hut and fear naught and justice shall walk blindfold throughout the land. Have ye chosen chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people? We have chosen, O king, came back the answer. It is well. Turn your heads and see how Twala's messengers go forth from the great town, east and west, and north and south, to gather a mighty army to slay me and you and these my friends and protectors. Tomorrow, or perchance the next day, he will come against us with all who are faithful to him. Then I shall see the man who is indeed my man, the man who fears not to die for his cause, and I tell you that he shall not be forgotten in the time of spoil. I have spoken, O chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people. Now go to your huts, and make you ready for war. There was a pause, till presently one of the chiefs lifted his hand, and out rolled the royal salute. Goom! It was a sign that the soldiers accepted Ignosi as their king. Then they marched off in battalions. Half an hour afterwards we held a council of war, 
at which all the commanders of regiments were present. It was evident to us that before very long we should be attacked in overwhelming force. Indeed, from our point of vantage on the hill, we could see troops mustering, and runners going forth from Loo in every direction, doubtless to summon soldiers to the king's assistance. We had on our side about 20,000 men, composed of seven of the best regiments in the country. Twala, so Infadus and the chiefs calculated, had at least thirty to thirty-five thousand on whom he could rely at present assembled in Lu, and they thought that by midday on the morrow he would be able to gather another five thousand or more to his aid. It was, of course, possible that some of his troops would desert and come over to us, but it was not a contingency which could be reckoned on. Meanwhile, it was clear that active preparations were being made by Twala to subdue us. Already strong bodies of armed men were patrolling round and round the foot of the hill, and there were other signs also of coming assault. Infadus and the chiefs, however, were of opinion that no attack would take place that day, which would be devoted to preparation and to the removal of every available means of the moral effect produced upon the minds of the soldiery by the supposed magical darkening of the moon. The onslaught would be on the morrow, they said, and they proved to be right. Meanwhile, we set to work to strengthen the position in all ways possible. Almost every man was turned out, and in the course of the day, which seemed far too short, much was done. The paths up the hill, that was rather a sanatorium than a fortress, being used generally as the camping place of regiments suffering from recent service in unhealthy portions of the country, were carefully blocked with masses of stones, and every other approach was made as impregnable as time would allow. Piles of boulders were collected at various spots to be rolled down upon an advancing enemy. Stations were appointed to the different regiments, and all preparation was made which our joint ingenuity could suggest. Just before sundown, as we rested after our toil, we perceived a small company of men advancing towards us from the direction of Lou, one of whom bore a palm leaf in his hand for a sign that he came as a herald. As he drew near, Ignosi, Infidus, one or two chiefs, and ourselves went down to the foot of the mountain to meet him. He was a gallant-looking fellow, wearing the regulation leopard-skin coat. "'Greetings!' he cried as he came near. "'The king's greetings to those who make unholy war against the king, the lion's greeting to the jackals that snarl around his heels.' "'Speak!' I said. These are the king's words. Surrender to the king's mercy ere a worse thing befall you. Already the shoulder has been torn from the black bull, and the king drives him bleeding about the camp. This cruel custom is not confined to the Kukuanas, but is by no means uncommon amongst African tribes on the occasion of the outbreak of war or any other important public event. Alan Quartermain. "'What are Twala's terms?' I asked from curiosity. "'His terms are merciful, worthy of a great king. "'These are the words of Twala, the one-eyed, the mighty, "'the husband of a thousand wives, lord of the Kukuanas, "'keeper of the great road, Solomon's road, "'beloved of the strange ones who sit in silence at the mountains yonder, "'the three witches.' calf of the black cow, elephant whose tread shakes the earth, terror of the evildoer, ostrich whose feet devour the desert, huge one, black one, wise one, king from generation to generation. These are the words of Twala. I will have mercy and be satisfied with a little blood. One in every ten shall die. The rest shall go free. But the white man, Incubu, who slew Scraga, my son, and the black man, his servant, who pretends to my throne, and Infadus, my brother, who bruised rebellion against me, 
these shall die by torture as an offering to the silent ones. Such are the merciful words of Twala. After consulting with the others a little, I answered him in a loud voice, so that the soldiers might hear, thus, Go back, thou dog, to Twala, who sent thee, and say that we, Ignosi, veritable king of the Kukuanas, Inkubu, Buguan, and Makumazan, the wise ones from the stars who make dark the moon, Infadus of the royal house, and the chiefs, captains, and people here gathered, make answer and say, that we will not surrender, that before the sun has gone down twice, Twala's corpse shall stiffen at Twala's gate, and Ignosi, whose father Twala slew, shall reign in his stead. Now go, ere we whip thee away, and beware how thou dost lift a hand against such as we are. The herald laughed loudly. Ye frighten not men with such swelling words, he cried out. Show yourselves as bold to-morrow, O ye who darken the moon. Be bold, fight, and be merry. Before the crows pick your bones till they are whiter than your faces. Farewell. Perhaps we may meet in the fight. Fly not to the stars, but wait for me, I pray, white men. With this shaft of sarcasm he retired, and almost immediately the sun sank. That night was a busy one, for, weary as we were, so far as was possible by the moonlight, all preparations for the morrow's fight were continued, and messengers were constantly coming and going from the place where we sat in council. At last, about an hour after midnight, everything that could be done was done, and the camp, save for the occasional challenge of a sentry, sank into silence. Sir Henry and I, accompanied by Ignosi and one of the chiefs, descended the hill and made a round of the pickets. As we went, suddenly, from all sorts of unexpected places, spears gleamed out in the moonlight, only to vanish again when we uttered the password. It was clear to us that none were sleeping at their posts. Then we returned, picking our way warily through thousands of sleeping warriors, many of whom were taking their last earthly rest. The moonlight, flickering along their spears, played upon their features and made them ghastly. The chilly night wind tossed their tall and hearse-like plumes. There they lay in wild confusion, with arms outstretched and twisted limbs, their stern, stalwart forms looking weird and unhuman in the moonlight. "'How many of these do you suppose will be alive at this time tomorrow? asked Sir Henry. I shook my head and looked again at the sleeping men, and to my tired and yet excited imagination it seemed as though death had already touched them. My mind's eye singled out those who were sealed to slaughter, and there rushed in upon my heart a great sense of the mystery of human life and an overwhelming sorrow at its futility and sadness. Tonight these thousands slept their healthy sleep. Tomorrow they, and many others with them, ourselves perhaps among them, would be stiffening in the cold, their wives would be widows, their children fatherless, and their place know them no more forever. Only the old moon would shine on serenely, the night wind would stir the grasses, and the wide earth would take its rest, even as it did eons before we were, and will do eons after we have been forgotten. Yet man dies not, whilst the world, at once his mother and his monument, remains. His name is lost, indeed, but the breath he breathed still stirs the pine tops on the mountains. The sound of the words he spoke yet echoes on through space. The thoughts his brain gave birth to we have inherited today. 
His passions are our cause of life. The joys and sorrows that he knew are our familiar friends. The end from which he fled aghast will surely overtake us also. Truly the universe is full of ghosts, not sheeted churchyard specters, but the inextinguishable elements of individual life, which having been can never die, though they blend and change, and change again forever. All sorts of reflections of this nature pass through my mind, for as I grow older I regret to say that a detestable habit of thinking seems to be getting a hold of me. While I stood and stared at those grim yet fantastic lines of warriors, sleeping, as their saying goes, upon their spears. Curtis, I said, I am in a condition of pitiable fear. Sir Henry stroked his yellow beard and laughed, and he answered, I have heard you make that sort of remark before, Quartermain. Well, I mean it now. Do you know, I doubt very much if one of us will be alive tomorrow night. We shall be attacked in overwhelming force, and it is quite a chance if we can hold this place. We'll give a good account of some of them, at any rate. Look here, Quartermain, this business is nasty, and one with which... Properly speaking, we ought not to be mixed up, but we are in for it, so we must make the best of our job. Speaking personally, I had rather be killed fighting than any other way, and now that there seems little chance of our finding my poor brother, it makes the idea easier to me. But fortune favors the brave, and we may succeed. Anyway, the battle will be awful, and having a reputation to keep up, we shall need to be in the thick of the thing. He made this last remark in a mournful voice, but there was a gleam in his eye which belied its melancholy. I have an idea Sir Henry Curtis actually likes fighting. After this, we went to sleep for a couple of hours or so. Just about dawn, we were awakened by Infadus, who came to say that great activity was to be observed in Lou and that parties of the king's skirmishers were driving in our outposts. We rose and dressed ourselves for the fray, each putting on his chain armor shirt, for which garments at the present juncture we felt exceedingly thankful. Sir Henry went the whole length about the matter and dressed himself like a native warrior. When you are in Kukuana land, do as the Kukuanas do, he remarked, as he drew the shining steel over his broad breast, which it fitted like a glove. Nor did he stop there. At his request, Infadus had provided him with a complete set of native war uniform. Round his throat he fastened the leopard-skin cloak of a commanding officer. On his brows he bound the plume of black ostrich feathers worn only by generals of high rank and about his middle a magnificent mukha of white ox-tails. A pair of sandals, a leglet of goat's hair, a heavy battle axe with a rhinoceros horn handle, a round iron shield covered with white ox-hide, and the regulation number of twalas or throwing knives, made up his equipment, to which, however, he added his revolver. The dress was no doubt a savage one, but I am bound to say that I seldom saw a finer sight than Sir Henry Curtis presented in this guise. It showed off his magnificent physique to the greatest advantage, and when Ignosi arrived presently arrayed in a similar costume, I thought to myself that I had never before seen two such splendid men. As for Good and myself, the armor did not suit us nearly so well. To begin with, Good insisted upon keeping on his new-found trousers, and a stout, short gentleman with an eyeglass, and with half of his face shaved, arrayed in a male shirt, carefully tucked into a very seedy pair of corduroys, looks more remarkable than imposing. In my case, the chain shirt being too big for me, 
I put it on over all my clothes, which caused it to bulge in a somewhat ungainly fashion. I discarded my trousers, however, retaining only my veldtskuns, having determined to go into battle with bare legs in order to be the lighter for running, in case it became necessary to retire quickly. The mail coat, a spear, a shield that I did not know how to use, a couple of toilas, a revolver, and a huge plume, which I pinned into the top of my shooting hat in order to give a bloodthirsty finish to my appearance, completed my modest equipment. In addition to all these articles, of course, we had our rifles, but as ammunition was scarce, and as they would be useless in case of a charge, we arranged that they should be carried behind us by bearers. When at length we had equipped ourselves, we swallowed some food hastily, and then started out to see how things were going on. At one point in the tableland of the mountain, there was a little copy of brown stone, which served the double purpose of headquarters and of a conning tower. Here we found Infadus surrounded by his own regiment, the Greys, which was undoubtedly the finest in the Kukuana army, and the same that we had first seen at the outlying corral. This regiment, now 3,500 strong, was being held in reserve, and the men were lying down on the grass in companies and watching the king's forces creep out of loo in long, ant-like columns. There seemed to be no end to the length of these columns, three in all, and each of them numbering, as we judged, at least eleven or twelve thousand men. As soon as they were clear of the town, the regiments formed up. Then one body marched off to the right, one to the left, and the third came on slowly towards us. Ah, said Infadus, they are going to attack us on three sides at once. This seemed rather serious news, for our position on the top of the mountain, which measured a mile and a half in circumference, being an extended one, it was important to us to concentrate our comparatively small defending force as much as possible. But since it was impossible for us to dictate in what way we should be assailed, we had to make the best of it, and accordingly sent orders to the various regiments to prepare to receive the separate onslaughts. End of 